The Undertaker has had many incarnations over the years. The tweaks to his character and persona over the course of his illustrious career has made his longevity so unmatched. Throughout his over 30 years in wrestling, the dead man always knew when to take some time away or when to change things up. Today, we'll rank each version of The Undertaker from the worst to the best. Number 9. The Gunslinger Taker's run as the Gunslinger came off the back of suffering his most devastating loss at WrestleMania 30. For a year, we patiently waited for the dead man's return, with some even wondering if he would ever return. WWE even offered him a place in the Hall of Fame during this time. When did they offer it to you the first time? The Brock WrestleMania? But Taker would turn it down as he had unfinished business in the ring. I couldn't end on a match that I didn't remember. You know, I got concussed and I, I don't remember even having that match. And once Taker returned, he would do so with a new look and alter in ring style. The Phenom had now become more of a brawler and would feature in some memorable matches with Brock Lesnar and the Wyatt family. But it was at WrestleMania 33 versus Roman Reigns when things started to take a turn in the ring. The idea was that this would be another of the incredible vintage Undertaker WrestleMania matches in what was meant to be Taker's final farewell. But because of how badly the match went, the dead man felt he needed to continue wrestling until he had the match he was happy to end his career on. And as he continued to chase the dragon, performing in the ring became harder as Taker simply just could not go like he used to, with his match quality suffering as a result. And this is why his final run as the Gunslinger is perhaps his most ill-remembered given how broken down he had become. Matches against the likes of Goldberg and against a returning DX really didn't help his cause. Thankfully though, he did turn it around in his final match against AJ Styles, which was a fitting farewell as he main evented WrestleMania for a final time. I will rest in peace. Thank you. Number eight, Western Mortician. The Western Mortician started it all for the demon from Death Valley. Right from his initial debut, he dominated, capturing the WWF Championship from Hulk Hogan just one year after the dead man's sensational debut at the Survivor Series. Following his loss to Hogan just six days later, he would go on an incredible unbeaten run as no one was able to pin him from December 1991 to September 1993. During this period, his matches continued to improve and he began to cut his iconic, eerie promos more as the years went on. There will be no resting in peace. There is no peace in The Undertaker's Mortuary. Taker would study villains from various different horror movies in order to nail every aspect of his character. That's what I studied. I, I could have told you anything about Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, or Freddy Krueger, or you know any of those guys it was destined to be. The Phenom was almost impervious to pain. He rarely spoke and sent terrifying shockwaves to fans and even some opponents. Just look at the reactions he would get from the fans, the referees, and even his fellow wrestlers. Oh! Overall, his first run came during a period where the WWF was more cartoony and colourful, so the undead zombie-like presentation of The Undertaker was a welcome contrast. It was a strong entry into the WWF for The Undertaker. The foundation had been set to be built upon as Mark Calloway was all in on the character. Number 7. Big Evil the Undertaker's heel turn on Raw 2001 shocked everyone. Taker hadn't been a heel for two years and the fact that he would cement his turn by attacking the beloved Jim Ross made it that bit more cruel. The Undertaker would become Big Evil and mark this run by regaining the WWE Championship. Big Evil was a sadistic, brawling, bully-like persona who demanded respect. Taker was so easy to despise during this time as he showed no mercy to everyone. Ingrained in our minds is the classic ladder match with Jeff Hardy and his feuds with Ric Flair and Brock Lesnar. Eventually he would turn face in this run and did everything in his power to make Lesnar into the star he would become as the two wrestled in numerous memorable matches. The big evil character would meet its demise at Survivor Series 2003 when Taker would be buried alive for the second time in his career. This by none other than Vince McMahon with the help from The Undertaker's brother, Kane. Number 6. Original Deadman the Royal Rumble 1994 would mark the nail in the coffin for the first run of The Undertaker, as a host of heels would place Taker into a casket and we wouldn't see him again for seven months. Upon his return, Taker would now don the black and purple in one of his most iconic looks. And it was this run where the Phenom would begin to cement himself as one of the greats. And while 1994 and 95 weren't great years for Taker in terms of programs and matches, he would fare much better in 96, feuding with the likes of Bret Hart, Diesel, Goldust and Mankind, with the latter feud being some of Taker's best work to that point. You can't kill what's already dead, as The Undertaker would continue to send chills down the spines of wrestling fans and anyone who dared cross him. Number 5. The American Badass 
The Undertaker would be hit with some injuries in the middle of 1999 and began to wrestle less whilst teaming with The Big Show and The Unholy Alliance. Taker would begin to shed the ministry and dead man personas more and more. Tonight, your mouth has wrote a check your ass can't cash. As we would see some seeds planted for what would become the next stage of Taker's career. As at Judgment Day 2000, The Undertaker would return to the WWF as the American Badass. Equipped with a motorcycle sporting a new look with a bandana and sunglasses, coming out to a new entrance theme sung by Kid Rock. This was the Attitude Era facelift the character needed, as it brought Taker into the new millennium. And although he didn't dress like Satan anymore, Taker was still down with the devil. I'm still down with the devil, and I will go medieval on your ass. Coming back from the injury, the American Badass had some limitations in the ring, as he wasn't in his best shape. This meant that his matches weren't as good as they could have been, and it's for that reason this persona doesn't rank higher on the list. But despite that, there is no denying the impact of this reinvention, which began what fans call today as the Biker Taker, with The Undertaker himself even stating that this incarnation of the character was the closest to his real-life self. And some people are like, well, you know, it's not the it's not the same Undertaker. Well, it's the same Undertaker, it's just Undertaker evolved is what it is. Number four, the Ministry. The larger-than-life supernatural aura of The Undertaker led to him becoming the leader of his own cult-like faction known as the Ministry of Darkness. Here, Taker would brainwash a number of wrestlers into becoming his followers, as the Lord of Darkness would fight to rule the WWF with an iron fist, competing with other stables such as the Corporation and D-Generation X. This made for great television and would help the WWF cement their lead over WCW in the Monday Night Wars. During the ministry's run, we would see them sacrifice and kidnap different talents like Stone Cold and even Stephanie McMahon. Where to, Stephanie? <laughs> The Ministry also acted as a launching pad for the Acolytes and Edge and Christian, who would go on to become bigger stars after leaving the group. The Undertaker was perfect as a cult leader, and was able to push the envelope with more edgier and risque storylines as the Attitude Era was fully underway. The only reason the Ministry Taker doesn't come in higher on this list is because of how short the run was, lasting just 8 months in total. Which is a surprise given how many incredible moments occurred involving The Undertaker during that time. But less surprising when we remember just how fast paced and insane the Attitude Era was. Number 3, The Last Outlaw. After being banished from WWE at One Night Stand 2008, The Undertaker would make his return at that year's SummerSlam, defeating Edge in one of Taker's signature match types the Hell in a Cell. Over the next few years, Undertaker would begin to wind down his career, popping in and out of WWE when the time was right. Buckle up, Teddy. And that was usually to come in and have the best match on WrestleMania year in, year out, this furthering his legendary WrestleMania winning streak. The streak had become just as immortal as the dead man. My match in defending the streak was you know, it was kind of more important than whoever was in the main event. It was unfathomable that anyone could defeat The Undertaker at WrestleMania. To break the streak was to live forever, and once it was fully broken, it would end this chapter of Taker's career. The streak is over! As the last outlaw, The Undertaker would end the career of Shawn Michaels and beat the game. And it was this stretch of time that Taker would look back on the most fondest. To start with me and Shawn, and then to end up with the three of us in the ring or on that stage together, you know, after Hell in a Cell, end of an era. I think those four matches are probably like my proudest uh, body of work. The Undertaker had already cemented his legacy as one of the all time greats, but his run as the last outlaw was the icing on top of the cake. Number two, Lord of Darkness. The Undertaker would be buried alive in October of 1996. Eventually returning a month later, darker and more menacing than ever. A single teardrop painted on his face appeared to symbolize that Paul Bearer had turned on him. But in reality, the teardrop was in the memory of someone close to Taker that passed away. It would be during this run that Taker would throw mankind off the hell in a cell in one of the greatest moments in WWF history. Taker would also compete in the very first cell match against Shawn Michaels in what's largely considered as the greatest cell match of all time, a match that Taker himself considers one of his favorites. My favorite match of, it'll probably stay in my mind, is probably the first Hell in a Cell with Shawn Michaels. But I think on a psychology and storytelling and physicality and brutality that the first Hell in a Cell was Shawn Michaels. For much of 1997, The Undertaker would hold the WWF title and it would be the end of the year where the dead man would begin his feud with his brother Kane in one of the most memorable wrestling feuds ever. Yes! The Undertaker! Number one. 
the modern phenom. The Undertaker entered WrestleMania to face his brother Kane in what was Taker's most anticipated return. This was the most identifiable Undertaker to date. The hat, the trench coat, the signature taunts, and the return of the tombstone as a regular finishing move. The dead man was about to embark on one of the best runs of his career as his famous WrestleMania streak kicked into gear. Taker was SmackDown's MVP and carried the brand through the entire ruthless aggression era. Taker's brilliance during this time was epitomized by the fact that he didn't need to hold the world title because without it, it was already accepted that he was number one. But rest assured, when he finally did win the strap, Taker would do so whilst in the best shape of his career, which showed given how good his in-ring work was. Who could forget when he and Sean stole the show at 2007 Royal Rumble by basically having a show-stealing mini-singles match on Taker's way to winning the Rumble. But it didn't stop there with legendary feuds and matches against Randy Orton, Kurt Angle, Batista, and Edge. And it when it comes to the dead man, whichever persona of his you recognize the most, there is no question that The Undertaker is a one-of-one one icon in professional wrestling, the most legendary character to grace the WWE, and now undeniable Hall of Famer. And that brings us to the end of this video. As always, I'd love for you to share your own thoughts and opinions on what run of Takers you think was the best. I'm sure many of you won't 100% agree with mine. But nevertheless, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you're looking for some similar content, check out my ranking on Undertaker's brother Kane's gimmicks over the years. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.